Good morning. A beautiful day in Washington, D.C. I want to welcome you all to the Global Innovators Women Leading Change Around the World event today here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And whether you are one of the 300 or more people registered for the event or joining us through our global webcast, I wanted to let you know that, that we will be tweeting today. You can follow the conversation on Twitter using hashtag GLA14 at USIP and at Vital Voices. So with that, my name is Kathleen Keenest. I direct the Center for Gender and Peace Building here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which for those of you who may be new to the Institute, we are an independent, nonpartisan institution established 30 years ago this year by the U.S. Congress to increase the nation's capacity to prevent violent conflict. Although we sit today in this lovely building dedicated to peace building, we stand ready and are in danger zones every day around the world to support nonviolent approaches to resolving conflict. And thus, the event today is especially relevant to our mission. We are very pleased to co-host this event again with Vital Voices, Global Partnership, and the Bernstein Family Foundation. The Vital Voices Global Leadership Awards recognize visionary leaders around the world who find innovative solutions to enduring problems, and they each make a significant difference in not only their communities, but far beyond the boundaries and borders of their countries. As you will see for yourself in a few minutes, the awardees are creative, courageous, clear-sighted and relentless women leaders who redefine the concept of power in their pursuit of a better world. They see possibility, and promise, and they act in the service of others. These women today come from four different countries, but together they fight for those whose dignity has been stolen by circumstances. We will have the opportunity to view short videos produced by Vital Voices about each of the work of each of the awardees. And then, in a very conversational way, we will hear remarks for, from each of the awardees and also open the discussion to you, our audience. So be prepared with some great comments, great questions to have this conversation. So before we begin our discussion, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Jennifer Smith to you. She is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Vital Voices Leadership Program. Jennifer has been uh, with Vital Voices for about four years, and her work in the past has been very engaged in corporate responsibility. So it's my pleasure to thank Vital Voices on behalf of USIP and to welcome you to the podium. Well, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us for a few hours and meet and um, get to know these incredible women that um, Vital Voices has had the privilege of working with um, for a number of years. Uh, I'm Jenny Smith. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Vital Voices, and my job is to help bring partners to the table so that the women that you're about to meet, um, so that they get to continue 
um, to do what they do so well and that we can provide at least a little bit of support in our way um, to help expand their vision for change. Uh, it's our pleasure to be here uh, this year. We've hosted this event in partnership with the U.S. Institute of Peace and Kathleen and her incredible team for the past three years, I think. Um, so thank you so much for your partnership and your leadership and the incredible platform that this institution provides um, to the women, uh, like the women that you're about to meet this morning. Uh, I also want to thank the Bernstein Family Foundation. We've had an incredible partnership with with you for the last number of years around the Global Leadership Awards uh, and the support that you provide to our honorees every year is um, incredible and invaluable. Uh, the Bernstein Family Foundation um, uses its philanthropic platform to create incredible social change focusing on American democracy, the arts, culture, and other notable causes. So we're, we're privileged to have a partnership with you and, and thank you very much for that. I'll just say um, just a little bit about Vital Voices and then we'll get started. We're a, a global NGO um, that's been around for about close to 17 years now and our mission is quite simple. We believe very much in the power of women's leadership and we search the world for incredible women who have a vision for change in their community, in their country, um, and around the world and we invest in them and we help bring that vision for change to scale. We provide mentoring, networking opportunities, training, capacity building, uh, and we believe very strongly that an investment in one woman can have transformational change in one community. And um, our honorees that you'll meet this morning are the perfect example of that. So I encourage you to ask questions, learn more about them, visit our website, uh, and and see how you can how you can get involved. And I'll just explain the the hashtag GLA. Uh, that's in reference to our Global Leadership Awards, which was hosted earlier this week, which honored these incredible women. So uh, we, we look forward to the conversation continuing, and, and thank you again for your time. Thank you. to uh, just mention that we do have simultaneous uh, translation for Spanish. If you would like to hear in Spanish, it is channel number three, and in English, channel number one. And uh, so to begin with our first honoree today, it is really a great honor <laughs> to introduce to you Claudia Pazzi Paz. She is the 2014 Leadership in Public Life awardee. Claudia is the first woman Attorney General of Guatemala. And I want to repeat that. She is the first woman Attorney General of Guatemala, a country, thank you, I think that is. <laughs> a country that has gone through some of the most brutal civil wars and recovery. And you are going to have the opportunity to hear how this woman has navigated a very difficult transition. She has been working in the justice system for 18 years as a legal expert, lawyer, and activist. She and she uh, received her doctorate in human rights and criminal law and served as judge and was the national consultant to the UN mission in Guatemala. To set the context for Claudia's work and for our conversation this morning, we will begin with a three minute video that highlights many of Claudia's achievements in her capacity as Attorney General of Guatemala. May we see the video now? <laughs> Dale, te voy a tener que pedir un favor que me haga, aunque no vas a salir en la peli, que yo le traigo. 
Es que no es que me traigas, es que la tetera está ahí arriba y no llego. Ah, ¿Aquí? Sí. Hace muy pocos años, aquí en Guatemala había un clamor que justificaba la venganza privada, los linchamientos, las ejecuciones extrajudiciales. Se detuvo 10 personas con 11 armas que iban a ir a atacar a la otra pandilla. A la otra pandilla. En una discoteca. Sí, iba a ser una masacre. Iba a ser una masacre. Se han detenido personas con armas de fuego que iban a ir a cometer muertes. Creo que muchos guatemaltecos, partidarios de la no violencia. Vine hace año y medio y, y vine porque me parecía muy importante lo que la doctora Claudia Pacepas está haciendo. No creo que a un hombre fiscal general le dijera un diminutivo de su nombre, pero a mí, Claudita, <ríe> mi hijita. <ríe> Pero eso fue más en un, al principio, ahora no. Estimo que ha sido una operación muy exitosa. Es uno de los narcotraficantes eh, más fuertes de la zona del oriente de Guatemala. ¿Le, le dio alguna vez miedo? Pues... Quizá miedo no, pero sí es una responsabilidad muy grande. Hubo un momento cuando mataron a un auxiliar fiscal en Alta Verapaz y dejaron su cuerpo en la gobernación departamental con una nota que decía dirigida a los fiscales. Ese momento fue muy duro, pero logramos esclarecer rápidamente el caso y los autores de ese asesinato están ya condenados. En la medida que hay una intervención efectiva, rápida, eh, de acuerdo con la ley, se reducen los niveles de violencia. Y creo que es algo que hemos logrado en, en estos años en la institución. Y eso ha sido gracias al esfuerzo de muchas personas. Algunas trabajan acá en el Ministerio Público, pero también al esfuerzo ciudadano que cree en la justicia que denuncia y que demandó en su momento que esos cambios en el sistema de justicia ocurrieran. O sea, Guatemala no se puede permitir un retroceso porque merece muchísimo más. So I'm just making sure we're all on. Great. Claudia, let's begin our conversation uh, and talk about this idea of somebody imagining you as Liddy, little Claudia and <laughs> Clearly, you have a different uh, leadership style. Tell us more about your leadership style and how you, uh, coming from your, uh, your background and your, uh, your world, were able to exert that kind of authority to make change last. Perhaps the first thing I would like to say that I'm deeply grateful. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? It is a pleasure for me to be here and to share my experiences during the last three years in Guatemala. My first point uh, is that the public ministry, as other justice institutions, 
used to be a male-dominated institution. The uh, previous attorney, attorneys and prosecutors were all male. And so my first step was to find people, or my first challenge was find people that would either ignore me or put, shove me to the side or uh, try to support me. So finally, I found people who supported me and they, are, they started being uh, uh, nicer and supporting me. But I believe that with the day-to-day -day work and with my day, everyday responsibility of uh, recognizing and giving value to everybody and to respect for everybody is something that we can do as women when we can play a role as leaders. Because I believe that women, we as women can play a different type of role, uh, a, a, tip, a different type of leadership, uh, different from men. Uh, we do it. Uh, across the, the board, not top down as usually happens with men. So there have been a lot of changes in the policy to uh, have a more equal treatment for everyone. The, the, the ministry, the public ministry, along with the police department, were dominated, male dominated, and also the, the victims, most of them were women, so we had to go along with them to, and provide that support. In terms of time, how long did that are we talking several years? Because that's a very big change to go from hierarchy to kind of a lateral approach to leadership. This, um well, I held my position for three years, but of course it's a very deep changing and transforming position because the first question that came up when I took my, my office as um, prosecutor as attorney general was the que my question was why was why were most of the attorneys male and if we compare we we could be half and half but especially in the smaller cities there was a majority of male dominated positions and also there is this idea that women join those positions or do not join those positions because they have family obligations or they have children or because they they fear for the safety of the children or families so my first proposal was I wanted to change that attitude. I wanted to create um, more equality, so I decided to appoint more women. But my uh, response of my female colleagues was no, because they had uh, kids, young children. And, but then I started changing that attitude slowly but surely. And so finally, uh, we, I achieved that. Of course, it took time, but it was a very a significant major change, especially when we started dealing with cases and handling cases of victims of sexual and gender-based violence. Because for a victim who has suffered that type of violence, to be able to be, um, to be uh, uh, cared for by a woman, by another woman, gives her more encouragement and assurance. We have seen cases of women who have been cared for or have had their cases seen by men, and they become once again victims of that as a sexual, either sexual harassment or, or violence. So what we are trying to do is to have a center, one-stop center, where we have professional and female uh, staff. We had a very particular case where we had made all these efforts to set up a 24-hour care center and a court um, for victims of gender-based violence because uh, violence is not, does not take place from 9 to 5, but it, it actually happens at night. And we knew that at that place, the, in that location, there was a lot of gender-based violence. And we did not understand why. We were making great efforts for people, for the staff working there to be able to, to train and to learn how to handle these cases. But then we found out the only male security, the male security guard was the first person at the, um, at the door where the women were entering the building to file the reports. And he was discouraging the women from going in. He was telling them, like, uh, what are you doing here? Are you sure you want to file a report? Why don't you just go back home? Of course, that uh, the, the important thing is that uh, we, we have to train both men and women. You've presented and created in Guatemala the 24-hour court. Is that transferable? Can, can we use that model in other places, or is it unique to Guatemala? 
in, in Guatemala, just like in many other countries, to, well, to typify women again, or to crimin criminalize violence against women, is something very recent as an offense. This is a very recent um, um, action. If the um, the woman, if the victim married her um, attacker, then there will be no liability for the uh, partner anymore. So there was very strong work done by women's organizations in order to give greater visibility to the issue of violence against women as a matter of national security. Now that offense is the one that is the most reported. And one of the debates that we used to have around 2010, 2011 was whether it was necessary to have specialized tribunals or specialized prosecutors' offices. And we were thinking, the question was, why should we have a difference? If justice should be the same for everyone, should there be a different courts for women and men and men and women? Well, they should be able to. They should be able to be cared for. But then we realized that that was not the case. That women could not go to the standard tribunals or courts. It is very important to have specialized courts that are trained in working and dealing with women, um, female victims, and especially working around the clock. We worked a lot or very close with uh, the attorneys working with these victims and one of the complaints that we heard a lot was why are there so many cases that are so very, very few cases that are solved and the women said well when we go to the courts we're the last ones in the, in the line and then the judge says oh your case your case is uh, violence against women oh you come back in three days and they postpone our hearing and also so we have had the, with this new effort that we have to have specialized courts for uh, only to deal with cases of violence against women, the response and the number of report, uh, reporting cases has been increasing a lot. And so the question whether this model can be transferable, I believe that it can be transferred to other countries and it would be advisable to do so. I agree with you and it's um, really a statement of that kind of innovation and understanding what goes on for women hour to hour, that it's not on a a day clock, it is 24 seven, and uh, your responsiveness to that issue really shows, I think, the kind of innovation that takes that is necessary to uh, uh, deal with uh, these uh, very critical problems that many women deal with. I have a question though now, before we open it up to our audience. Claudia, before you were the Attorney General of Guatemala, was there a day, was there a minute, was there just a progression in which you realized this was your work? I'm thinking of the many young women in this audience who want to know how to recognize that moment when you just need to do something to make a difference. But, uh, to be completely honest, I never imagined that I would come to, uh, that I would become an attorney general. I saw myself more as being a lawyer, human rights lawyer, perhaps a judge, not as, a, as a, uh, an attorney general. We went through a very strong crisis in Guatemala. Uh, Guatemala had a rate of 55% impunity rate, and an attorney general was appointed who had to be ousted afterwards because he had been involved in organized crime cases, and then there was a, that idea that impunity will continue. So at that time, a new nominating committee opens up in order to appoint a new a, a prosecutor general. And then we were together sitting around with some colleagues in a room very similar to this one, and the candidates were all male. To the, for the position of attorney general. So I said, I made a remark, you see how it's only male are present here, not women. And then one of the men present there said, because women do not want to participate, but you do, you do want to get involved. And at that point I thought, so what happens if I do get involved? 
and then the, the, then the concern is what's going to happen with my family? Am I going to jeopardize my family's safety? What's going to happen with my reputation, with my name? How am I going to deal with this? Because this is um, a, a position a, in a public ministry with more than 5,000 um, staff members. So finally, I thought, well, uh, I thought I was never going to be elected, but I, I applied for the position anyway, and then I, finally, I, then I was picked. I want to open it up now for a Q&A from the audience. And if you're interested in making a comment, if you could just raise your hand right now, I'm going to take three questions. And if you would introduce yourself and a representation of your organization, that would be great. And please stand when you make the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Pat Melia Dole. I am from Liberia. I work for the Civil Society and Media Leadership Program. And I'm also a student of law in my country. I want to congratulate our panelists for her efforts so far in working towards justice in her country and fighting against uh, domestic and sexual gender-based violence. Um, from her explanation, their context is quite similar to ours in Liberia. Uh, we've set up a lot of systems in place, like one-stop shop centers, safe homes, and there's been a lot of training for the judiciary, including the justice system. And also there's a specialized court for domestic violence. However, in my country, domestic violence and sexual and gender-based violence is grossly underreported. So I like the panelists to share with me what particular measures, if there are any, that she has had in her country to kind of increase and encourage reports to make it to the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. And I'm going to take another one before Claudia answers here. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Otto Rel Tiomans. I'm actually Guatemalan as well. Um, and my question to you is that until recently, Guatemala was known for being predominantly masculine in all levels of governance. Uh, and people like you, Sandra Torres, Yasmin Barrios, they really did make the way for women to become more involved. And my question to you is, how do you think women can become more involved, not only more in society, but also in other levels of government, aside from law? Thank you. And one more question up here to the left. Marzia, and I'm working with Women for Afghan Women. And my question is, how do the nonprofit organizations for women in your country work? And how the government and nonprofit organizations like work together? I mean, like, uh, do you work more with the government or nonprofits? Thank you. Claudia. Yes, there is no doubt that when it comes to gender-based violence and violence against women, there are cases that never reach the justice system because of shame, because of fear, because women have no other place to go to. One of the measures that I took was to guarantee that the victim was cared for in her own language. Because in Guatemala, we have many dialects, many language. So we made sure that we provided help in the victim's language. And the victim was cared for by um, a woman that the courts and the prosecutor's offices were located closer to the victim. So this model that was first implemented in Guatemala City then was taken to other cities where there were very high rates of violence against women, especially sexual violence. And there was a commitment made, I believe, with the media, mass media, who started, that started to report daily about uh, the uh, the cases, the, the cases that, that were taking place, for instance, how many rapes, and so they started reporting more. So I believe that that work with the mass media was not only very helpful, not only reporting the facts as they took place, but also to show a face to it. And also this made it possible for more women to come forward to report. For instance, as the, uh, while the homicide rate went down, 
the other uh, uh, rates that went up were violent crimes, for instance, and I believe because there were greater, it's just because there were greater reporting by women, that's why, that explains the high rate of violent crimes. Since the public ministry in Guatemala has the obligation of dealing with the victim, it is very difficult to do it by itself. So what we have done is referral networks where non-governmental organizations specialized in medical, psychological care, and also shelter, provisions, employment, economic empowerment, they can provide support to those women. So once they come to the public institution, they are referred to the other non-governmental organizations for that additional care, where we provide them with that help. And I believe now how to get more women involved as far as that, I believe that one of the mechanisms is the more women getting uh, participating, getting involved, becoming active, that will speak for itself. I believe that it's very telling, for instance, that when I uh, submitted my application for, uh, for uh, out of 44 candidates, there, was four, there were four women. And out of the, uh, when we um, were running, running, having, holding elections for presidents, also there were a few women. So this is changing. Now uh, th about a third of, of women, or, or a third of the participants in all the elections are women. And now, so n this is changing. There is more uh, female participation in elections for public office. So to the extent that those public offices are held by women and there is more visibility, there is more consistent uh, tra uh, and transparent um, management and, and uh, accountability. So that's very important as, a, as our case. I do see that uh, your plan about making sure that these uh, courts are closer to the victim, the, the language, and engaging them in media, that to me seems like one of the more difficult uh, parts of the story because as with court systems, it's often very male-dominated. How did you convince the media? How did you engage them? And how do you engage men in your process to understand why this is, a, is about equal rights for all? Well, it was not my work alone. It has been a team work by women's organizations in Guatemala for many years now. I don't know whether you're familiar with the high rate of violent deaths of uh, deaths of women in Guatemala is one of the highest rates of homicide of, for of women in the region. And once we put this on the agenda, that we g uh, gave greater visibility to the problem, then we had very emblematic cases. We had the case of Cristina Cicadisi, who, who was a woman who disappeared. She went missing. She was murdered by her husband. He took off with her, uh, their children. He's already prosecuted. But those type of cases, that were highly visible and that were publicized by the media and they showed they were showing the citizens that it was not a problem only that affected some but that affected all so that also made it possible for the media to start taking more of this type of initiative and also for more men to becoming involved and to feel that it's not the women who are affected but it's all society that is affected Shift in the thinking. I am so sorry, I have to keep altering this. I want to just offer one more round of questions with Claudia. This is such an important area of work that I know we're doing uh, in the world, and uh, Claudia exemplifies this women in leadership in law. My name is Claudia Enriquez, uh, so Guatemalteca también, y quería. My name is Claudia Enriquez, I am from Guatemala as well. I would like to ask you, how do you see the future of women in Guatemala? Now that, well, you already answered this partially, but the uh, uh, processes and measures that you have started, do you believe they will continue? Then we'll end on the future of women in Guatemala. Sí, creo que es una pregunta. Yes, I think that is, um, that's a key point, key question in this, uh, this time. It is critical. 
and it's so, the most important thing is that we don't go backwards because we have made such great strides in the area of justice, in being able to solve more cases, in providing greater access to women, of women to justice, to the justice system, reduction in the homicide rate, which we, we would not think it would be possible from 46 per 1,000, we dropped it to 34 per each 1,000 um, inhabitants. And this is cri critical because uh, we are running elections for uh, the judiciary at this time, so that's very important. And also the citizens should be involved, they should be involved and should be engaged in all the process and they should exercise the right to monitor the functioning, the operation of institutions. And I, I, I'm, I'm confident that we will not be going backwards. With you in that leadership role, and really as a global leader, you've offered us so much to think about this morning and really a roadmap of how this kind of work can be uh, implemented in other countries. I really want to congratulate you again, and on behalf of the audience and our viewing audience, to thank you for everything you do every day in service not only of your country, but really of the world. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. So if you want to stand up, talk, introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you or behind you, and I'm going to invite our other uh, awardees to the podium. <laughs>
think we should <laughs> implement this in every one of our events. It's just a mid-break event. <laughs> it's good for the energy here. So we're going to begin our second panel now. I think the first panelist has inspired us certainly uh, to think differently about solving these problems. And our three following panelists uh, will, I think, even expand our lens about what it means to innovate in a very complex global context. You will no longer need the earphones, so uh, you can, uh, unless you want to listen in English, uh, we're going to begin. Our second panel really brings us into the context of three different countries, uh, one in war, one in peace, and one in a society where there is a high degree of everyday violence. And we're going to look at how these three honorees have worked on solving these issues. Our first panelist, and we'll talk first each one individually, then have a group conversation, and then open it up uh, to another full conversation with you all. I want to uh, introduce to you uh, Suad Alami. Suami uh, Alami is the 2014 Fern Holland Awardee of the Vital Voices Leadership Program. She is a lawyer from Iraq with over 20 years of experiencing and practicing family law. She has served on the Baghdad Provincial Council and the Sadr City District Council. She opened the NGO Women for Progress in Sadr City, which is the first legal clinic especially for women in the country of Iraq. Her work includes providing free legal representation for women in cases of divorce, custody, and gender-based violence. Please join me now while we watch the video on Suad Alami's work. This is me in this photo. I'm standing in front of my NGO, Women for Progress. And this is the, the main door to the building. When I start my, my NGO, it's just to help uh, women legally. We found ourselves that uh, that is not enough. They need more than the, the legal assistance. They need social assistance. This woman, uh, her name Jamila. And Jamila, it's mean, beautiful, pretty. But she doesn't have the beautiful or pretty life. She feeding here her two uh, sons. One of them is handicapped and he cannot talk. She is living with uh, her mother. She is very old. She has to work to raise her her children. So we try to to empower her economically. This girl, her name Noor, she came to us to ask for the divorce six months after the marriage. And this is her mother and this is her, her father. The family, there are 11 people living in this one, one room. Most of the women who they get divorced, when they return back to their own family, they cannot afford another member to come to live in the house. Uh, her name is Sabri. She's now, I think, 24 or 25 years old. She's divorced 
twice. Many of our cases here, they're getting married 12, 13 years old, and then they get divorced one year or even less than this. You can see I mean, the early marriage, it is, it, is, it is a domestic violence. The father, he is handicapped and he, he cannot work. So they are baking the bread and selling the bread in the neighborhood. They make this a small business to, to feed the family, to help their family. I mean, for the poor people, they c cannot afford to hire a a lawyers. How they can get their legal rights? Should be there some places that they can seek the help to see that there's someone standing for them to help them. They start to believe that their life will be better, that they are a human being, that no one can violate their rights. We are working to make the people have a hope. Last line, Suad, we are working to help the people have hope. I think that's particularly poignant today. Tell us about the ways that you hope to continue providing services and operating under the current conditions. It seems like it's more needed than ever. Well, uh, good morning. And thank you so much uh, to, uh, to have this opportunity to meet all of you and uh, thank you for, uh, you know, for to letting us talk today and express our experience and our work in our home countries. Um, it is always for, in, in, in terms of the, my country, it, it was difficult and hard to, to work in, the, in, in such environment, conflict, uh, sectarian violence, and uh, the neglecting by the, by the government. And, uh, despite that, the Iraq is considered the middle-income country. But people, they haven't seen any kind of uh, that the change that they just sacrificed their lives daily, <coughs> starting 2003 until now. It have been 11 years. And just only the things and the life is just getting hard and worse and worse. I believe that I, f I find myself just from very beginning that I have to do something, and it, 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 I, I believe it is just an, a responsible uh, to be responsible, and this is responsibility. Should be anyone can 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 take it and uh, handle this responsible. Um, being or uh, living in in such environment, and with these people in particular. I just came among them, these this people. This is just give the, the trust, the people that they need, that someone who worked, came from them and being with them and understanding well what they, ha what they are going through and what life that they, they, they experience. It is not just in theory, it is just practical. So, from all the experience that we, I, I have it, I just wanted to put it how I can tackle the needs of these people that we are working. So just providing that, would, I believe it is still not enough and with the limited resources that we have uh, to continue the, 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 the work and to continue 
at least we, at least we are now breaking the the, the 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 wall of the silence of these women just to 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 talk and in this uh, specific current situation in Iraq i think i think that there's our responsibility it should be doubled and doubled and just keep working with them with the this high risk that's in in Iraq with the I just, uh, when I left Iraq just uh, last uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, June 11th, uh, the, the situation just one day before that, it just, just getting deteriorated. And uh, um, everyone now, they are just holding the, the, the arms, weapons, and no one can know who, is, who, is, who they are, the good people, who they are not. Who's going? Might be the uh, uh, where is the government? Who can provide the, the needs? There are so uh, the the lack of the of the food of the waters. Um, it is just kind of mess. And I, when I, I just eager, I, I wish that I just to go back now to Iraq to just help these people because I think this is the, the, the moment it should be with them and to just continue and to see how we can help them more than we, we, we did before because this is just really very critical time and uh, which is impact on these people. This is just current situation impact more than these people who they were all, all, uh, all uh, already their lives just and they are living in terrible lives so now it is just getting worse so i believe that we all should standing and to 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 work helping these people in, uh, now and and tomorrow and always the challenges have as you pointed out only increased in the last week yeah and in another week you'll return what will be the first thing you do? Um, the first thing it is just um, we try, you know, to to come together as uh, as all the activist uh, NGOs. I know it is not uh, the might be the government uh, have their own priorities and in terms of the security, but this. United States in particular and the other international <coughs> communities. I think uh, with the, the just that last few years that what has happened in the in the in the region, um, which is just uh, I'm just uh, talking about the 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 Arab. Uh, uh, uprising uh, revolutions in in the region, it just just impact that uh, 
the support that we, we were taking, uh, getting for to Iraq and to Iraqis people. Um, I think my 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 message now, which is just to 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 tell that please don't forget Iraq, because Iraq should be the example for the change in the region, which we 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 started this even in in 2003, and the other countries in the region they just started to to have this change in in just 2011. So we want to be an example and a good example for the transition from dictatorship to the democracy. So I think we just hope that I say please don't forget Iraq and and keep support us in fighting all these things that we, we, we have just to achieve the, the, the democracy, that uh, to have a better life at least with the very simple standards, not the high standards that we are looking for. And to have a peace and security for, because this is what, what, what we miss. We cannot even, if you ask anyone in Iraq what you are going to do tomorrow, then I, I do not know. I do not know if I am going to live tomorrow or not. So we do not have this hope or to planning to our even next day of the future. So that is what I, I, I want to, to say. Thank you. Don't forget Iraq. I think that uh, it would be good to turn now to the audience because I think there are questions and concerns. And I'm going to just ask uh, the microphone. Thanks. And, uh, Please, right here. And do I have another question? And here, in the front row. Right here. Thanks. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Augusto Bejar, and I work for BISLAC, which is the Latin American Center for uh, Entrepreneurial Development. Uh, my question uh, would be, of course, to Saad Alami. I'm completely honored to be here, definitely, in front of you who demonstrate uh, that our world is getting much better. Uh, my question is, um, in the case of Iraq, much of the violence happens, of course, due to culture. Does your organization touches the issues, for example, within the culture, like, for example, within, like, Islam, trying to, like, try to see if culturally, uh, the cultural cycle Can also be a the mic? Yeah, It's very difficult to hear on this mic. Yes. Can we transfer mics, perhaps, because it's... Oh. Uh, maybe, or hold it a little further. Uh, like this? Just, no, I don't know what it is. Let's try a different mic. So sorry, but... Uh, like this? No, it's much better. <laughs> maybe a further down. <laughs> a little oh. further. Okay, uh, directly with a question. Uh, the question would be, uh, much of these issues that have gone in Iraq now, uh, especially when it comes to violence against women, there are many, uh, I'm not saying that not all, but many, for example, within these areas, uh, put like Islam as a kind of like part of the, part of the, part of the fault, like something that actually is like um, not very friendly to women. What your organization tries to do when it comes, for example, uh, when it comes to these issues, when it comes to Islam, for example, uh, if the like reinterpretation of the text, um, that's something I will, uh, I'm very intrigued So the to social know. cultural issues yes. surrounding women's roles in society. Thank there you so much. And I'm going to Thank take you. the second question right here and if there is a third and then I will open it up to so Danielle right here thank you hi my name is Kathy Burke and I am a mother I brought my daughter uh, today so that she thank can you. see what um, is going on outside of Fairfax County um, thank you my question, and I think this is for all the women here, and I congratulate you, and I appreciate what you're doing. I can hear it in your voice. How do you avoid the burnout? How do you go day in and day out with the troubles and the heartbreak and not say, forget it, I'm going to Disneyland, I'm out of here. And then imagine it applies to all these ladies. How do you avoid that? Great question. I think I'll turn right now, Suad. 
One is yeah. about social cultural predicament of women, and one is about how do you make it every day? Yes. Uh, in terms of this, uh, the social issues or cultural issues, uh, there is a major uh, challenge in this area, which is impact on the on the on the women in different levels. Uh, the whole women's issues. I mean, her participation, her rights, uh, her uh, uh, her role in the in the society, the, the education, the gender-based violence, all this. Um, our role as as a women's groups, as as NGOs in Iraq, it is just how we can. Um, involve more women and raise their awareness and how we can mitigate this social issues and the cultural issues. Because it is quite a challenge for her and for even the, the, her family. Iraq is considered <laughs> an, a tribal domination society, which is, this is also part of the, this cultural issues. If, if you are talking, if I, I want talking about the, the gender-based violence, 2009, it was kind of taboo to talk about gender-based violence. Even that the women or the families, the, the, the decision makers, the decision makers always they say, we do not have, they deny, they said, we do not have a gender-based violence. Why you are saying that? It just, just hit our, our, the Iraq reputation. And that is just, you know, before 2009. And then with the whole, the whole work that all that we are doing, it is just we raised, we put these issues on the table. And with the, this huge work, now we, the government just take some steps towards tackle this kind of, of issues. And they start to admit that we have this, this cultural issues. And they established the family protection units, is, is a governmental body with the Ministry of Interior. They drafted a law, which was, we hope that they will legislate it in the next uh, parliament. And this, and then also, it is most important for women themselves, how they can start to believe to cross these cultural issues and to break the, 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 the wall of silence. And you, from the film that you just watched now, women just want to talk. Women just want someone to listen to them. To, 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 to f might be they just want to have someone can help them find a place like that, that our NGO that we are doing. It's just how we helping them, try to listen to them, what kind of needs they need. Because when we are providing just actual or real services to touch their needs, that is make different for them, and you will just build the trust, and that will just overcome all the cultural issues. I will not say we are, we are trying to, to, to just to enhance, to improve the, the, the situation for, for, for women. And also, this is not only with women, but women and men together. And with the, some of our work that we started to work with the local leaders in the, in the community, which they are now very well standing, understanding the, the situation and how, how like the issues of the gender-based violence it just impact on the, on the security of the country at, uh, in, in general. And how do you avoid burnout? Avoid uh, the cultural issues. How to avoid what we call here burnout, meaning every uh. day we wake up <laughs> and these very impossible, tragic issues face you. How do you get up every day and maintain that sense of hope and commitment? Because, because 
always I'm, I'm saying I have a, a passion to, to, to do that. I believe that I just went uh, get the course and I couldn't go back. And also that because also for me, I thought there's no another option. This is the only option. It is just to help this woman, and I believe this is my responsibility as 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 a woman to bring to bring the women's issues. Because if we are if we, if we, the women will not bring these issues, who are going to bring that to the to the public life? So I'm um, just I I feel that uh, I feel this with the commitment, with the passion that I have towards uh, my my community, and I feel that I have to make this change to make the differences for the people life, and ju just I feel that um, always when I'm saying I have to do this and I have to do this and will not keep aside and just watching, because if we are just watching and we are not do anything, I think no one, nothing will change and our life will not be uh, going forward. I think that answer, no, no more watching, we have to be doing. That is really the sign and, and really the eloquence that you put into your leadership. We so appreciate your efforts every day and thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. We know that uh, in societies that are not at war, they still every day have to address the inequalities of women's access to economic gain. And our next honoree, Victoria Kisambi, is one of those examples of remarkable leadership. Twelve years ago, Victoria opened her own business called Selfina. It was about loaning and leasing productive assets to other women. What an innovative idea. We need things so that we can produce other things. And Victoria really set out to do that. She has generated sustainable income for each woman, woman borrower. And the other night when she received the award, she said, I have 25,000 women standing behind me. <laughs> and we're going to hear more about not only Victoria, but those 25,000 women. But first, we're going to uh, show the video about the work that she does in Tanzania. In Tanzania, most women don't own land. But the main collateral in this country is land. So a micro lease allows a woman to finance business growth. In this way, even women without credit history can access financing. The life of a micro lease starts with a partner, a funder, someone who wants to help make a difference in the lives of others. It's because of them that we can work with so many women. We want to make sure these investments are fruitful. So on Mondays, prospective clients come for training. They learn business skills and the process of taking a lease. They write a proposal and they provide at least two guarantors. We meet with them in our office and in their homes. When the lease is approved, the asset is delivered. And the potential of the business really explodes. With increased capacity, she makes small payments over a number of months. And at the end of the lease, we pass the ownership to her. For many women, this is the first time they get to own an asset in their own name. 
Once she owns it, she can leverage the asset as collateral for a traditional loan, or she can sell it back to us for liquid capital and continue to lease. From one very modest lease, she can create dozens of jobs. To begin, Justina leased 100 baby chicks. Today, she has more than 1,500 chickens producing eggs. She sells those eggs in the community and beyond. Justina is a savvy businesswoman and her whole family works for her. Women are so resourceful. From a handful of the most basic resource, they grow something really extraordinary. Well, it has been a journey, um, and actually, um, when faced with challenges, that's when I've come to learn, that's when you get strengthened and you feel, yes, there's something I need to do. And mine, of course, started with difficulties, but then um, I also realized that uh, cultural barriers were really, um, putting many women in difficult situations. Not that our government is saying women should not benefit, but then it's just the historical, the cultural, the traditional system, you know, the inheritance or the ownership system that actually marginalizes the women. And because of that, then, um, they find themselves, we find ourselves in a position whereby we cannot tap into the financial institutions because we lack those, um, the necessary equipment to, to use. And uh, for me, the journey started with, uh, when I, I looked around, I just saw that at least, despite the challenges that I was facing at that particular moment, at least I had this one cow, which was called Cero, and um, I looked at it now in a, in a, in a more positive way, that, I, that it was possible for me to sell milk, to feed my children with, with, the, with the milk from the cow. So it opened my eyes to feel that, well, at least there is an asset. And that was after I tried to go to several financial institutions and asked for a title deed, which I did not have. So I started counting on the strength of what I have in my hands, and that was the cow. So I felt there are other women who do not even have the cow, so what can we do to assist them? If they could have an asset, we could go around this problem of not owning something, they could immediately go into business. And that's when the idea of leasing came into, into effect and uh, we got started, yeah. Started with a cow. Yeah. What was the first thing beyond the cow? What was the first thing you leased in your new business? Okay. Um, of course, there is, like I said, it's a journey, but it was a dream, I have to do something. Now to get started then, I realized I had also to know what were the actual needs of the women, because in my idea, this is what they would need, but then I had to understand what were the actual needs. So the first thing, I had a few women who believed in my in my thoughts. So the first thing we did was to conduct a baseline survey to see what would actually benefit the women most. 
And uh, out of the baseline survey then, we realized that, okay, the, the wood need, there is a need for the uh, productive assets, but coupled with that, there is also a need for training. So we embarked first on training programs in raising the capacity to manage uh, whatever the women have. So we were first of all encouraging the women that if you have even five chicks, that's your starting point. At least you have something. So if you manage it well, if you sell eggs or feed the children, um, save a bit of that, then you'd have maybe 50,000 shillings that's in our currency. Then you don't need to borrow, but you can actually revolve that man and grow your business from that, from that small <coughs> capital that you have. But, but then that led to our business um, training skills, um, business management skills, and also uh, it came to our attention, of course, we are in sub-Saharan Africa. HIV AIDS is also rampant, it's also a big problem, so we also started to conduct trainings in HIV AIDS to, to raise the awareness and also to avoid the stigma and how to live health, health life if you have HIV AIDS. And we later on created a, a window for women who were raising uh, orphaned children or in, uh, in that situation. But also, uh, we saw there was also a need to invite women lawyers to come to our institution to talk to the women, especially on two issues, land issues and inheritance issues. These were very pertinent problems to, to the women. So as we went on, on the training, it was clear that no matter how much we trained them, still it was not enough because then access to finance was still a big issue. These women could still not go to the traditional financial institutions to access finance. And that's how then we started now to, to, to go into the leasing. And to start with, we did a pilot on three areas which most, most women are engaged with in my country. Uh, many women are in food, I can say food industry or anything to do with food. They'll, be do, they'll do food vending or they would cook for weddings or whatever. So we decided to lease equipment that would go into that, um, that sector. And then the second sector was tailoring. Yeah, our women like to tailor uh, our African designs, like this one has been done by one of our clients. And they would lease machine to make chain stitch machine, chain stitches like this. Yeah, and uh, then the third one uh, was the secretarial business because uh, it was very clear that um, most of the women, those who are lucky to be employed, then they would be employed in stereotype jobs. They would just be secretaries uh, and they would earn, you know, just... Uh, the wage, not that enough. But then when we give them equipment, then they would open up their own secretarial bureau, they would manage their own businesses. They wouldn't have to go around looking for jobs, and some of them were creating jobs for their own daughters as well. So when this worked well, then we opened up. Now there are women who are leasing even their old chicks, um, dairy cows, etc. milling machines, water pumps. Talk about the ability to replicate this model. It sounds like something that could happen yeah. anywhere and everywhere. It's a fabulous design Thank and it uh, sounds like it's really working. I want to open it up to the audience here because I'm sure there are questions about this approach. I have many more questions, please, <laughs> right here. 
Okay. Could you introduce yourself? We'd love to know who you are. Um, I'm Beth Brownson. I was uh, with State Department as a political officer in Mumbai and worked with Priti there. Uh, I was a gender justice advisor in Afghanistan. So I followed women's empowerment issues in many different contexts. And the issue of microfinancing for women is a program in a number of different countries. But how, when women traditionally did not have assets, did you convince your financial backers to give you the money to start the program? Thank you, Beth. Great question. Another one right here. Hi, thank you. My name's Emma. I'm from the Women's Democracy Network. Um, we work towards women's political inclusion globally, um, but we've noticed, um, as many of us I'm sure have, that women's agency, um, particularly economic agency and ability to support themselves, is really closely linked with political activism. And I'm wondering whether you've seen in your experience women becoming more politically active um, after becoming, after going through training or after um, receiving leases from you. Thank you. Right, Emma. And is there one, there's one more question up at the very top, and then we're going to turn it back to Victoria for her comments. Hi, my name is Tiffany Boykin. I'm with Human Revolutions. And my question is that for the women who become um, entrepreneurs and uh, earners of income. I saw in a video that there were men employed. Um, how do you help with that change in dynamics um, if they are in a household and they are the breadwinners or they're in a community and they are employing men? Um, is there an issue of training or developing to prepare for any type of acts of resistance or violence because of their accomplishments? Great questions. Thanks so much from the audience. Victoria, I'm going to let you uh, address them as you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, these are good questions. Uh, we, it was possible for us to interest the, the bankers because we started small. We put whatever the small money which we had, but for each lease that we were doing, it would go through the bank. The money would be in the bank. So each woman, uh, each lease would finance it through the bank. So the bankers could see the turnover. You see, when the women pay back, we deposit the money in the account. And each lease, we draw the money out of the account. So the money goes in, goes out, and the banker can see that transaction and immediately sees that here I have a good client. For instance, I can give you an example. We started very small and then very early in the, in the early years, we were lucky to receive uh, a donation from the women of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And I take this opportunity to thank them. They gave us $5,000. And that money we put into our bank account. And so whenever we would approve a lease, it would draw down from that account. And uh, the women also put a, a deposit, a, like um, um, it's like a cash collateral, 20%. So that money goes into that account. And each month when they pay, it goes into there. From the 5,000, it went to 20,000. And any good banker can see. <laughs> so when they saw that was going to, we, as we, and the women were, the, the, the needs were increasing, so we approached the banker and said, look, um, this is what we are doing, and we have a line of clients. They want more, we've approved a lot more. So immediately, the banker gave us a, um, a 20 million, overdraft, which would be like um, $10,000 more or less. And within a month or two, they could see how that the turnover was. They increased the overdraft from 20 million to, to 40 and immediately went to 100 because we were working with them. So when they see how it operates, even the bank, um, 
uh, understands. And maybe I can mention here that um, we started the lease program even before our country had a leasing law. So there was a time uh, IFC was interested in promoting leasing in Africa. They started with Tanzania. So they came to us and we were working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And to reach a point then, they used our model to, to convince the decision makers. So there was a time I was invited to, to our parliament and I was talking to the members of parliament, like I'm talking to you today about what we were doing, and we contributed to, 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 to convincing the, the decision makers, and now Tanzania has a leasing law. So even the banks now are going more into the leasing. And uh, the second one, um, how, how if the women are, uh, going more into the, they become more politically active, I would say yes. Uh, when we empower them economically, then um, actually what happens, you give them a voice. And that's what I said even when, during our, during the, the, when I was receiving the award, it was really true, it was coming from my heart, what Vital Voices is doing today, gives us a voice, and the voice actually transcends to all the women that we represent. Economic empowerment is very powerful, because then the women become decision makers in, at their own homes, in the society, and with that, you find that they, are become, they become socially uh, empowered, and the next thing, some of them start vying for political positions. And we've had women who've um, vied for uh, local leadership within their villages. And some of them have gone beyond even to, uh, to, to apply for member of parliament positions, which in the past wouldn't have been possible. So, I mean, I'm not saying we are not all, they are only actors, but we are, we take part in empowering women, and now today in Tanzania, even the government is really supporting men and women are in the political arena. But almost 80% of our district commissioners now are women. And uh, in the parliament, we have more than 33% representation, which are women. So we have our own small role, which we are playing, but it turns towards what? the overall um, situation in the country is doing. And there was a question on men being employed. Yes, we do, um, right from the beginning, we take on board uh, to sit down and talk with the men, first of all, the husbands. Uh, if you are going to give a lease, so for instance, you are giving a freezer, which is going into a home, and if the husband doesn't know, and if something goes wrong, he might even not allow you to go into the house. So we sit down with them, explain what this is all about. But more important, we want them to, to work together with the women. And we've seen when we have men supporting their wives, you find the, the, the business goes well and the family uh, unity becomes even better. And uh, we feel happy because we want them united rather than uh, splitting. So women empowerment should not actually lead to separation of families, rather should bring them together. But, and also, um, we finance women, but then if they can create jobs for men, that's even better. So that's what, <laughs> that's what we are doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Victoria. This is a really uh, example of Extreme innovation, you keep innovating on your innovation, if you will, and it is a really powerful example of change in your society all the way into the parliament. I hope you'll join me now in thanking and recognizing the parliament. And finally, in this really amazing morning of both inspiration and challenging all of us to do less watching and more doing. I turn to Priti Patkar, 
who is the 2014 Human Rights Awardee of the Vital Voices Program. Fritti has worked uh, in one of Mumbai's most marginal groups, prostituted women. And in order to break this cycle of exploitation, Fritti opened four childcare centers that offer comprehensive 24-hour-a-day childcare. The shelters provide meals, health care, education, and most importantly, a safe place for these children to live overnight. We're going to watch a brief video, and then we look forward to talking to you, Priti, about your work. I did not know what my mother did for a living. She was trafficked into the sex trade by a woman from her village. She knew the woman. We were paying rent, but we did not stay inside the house. The rent was for allowing us to stay outside the house. We had to sleep on the road. It was an environment where anything bad could have happened at any time. The world of such children remains limited to the red light area. They internalize what they see around them and they begin to believe that what is happening is normal and right. They will eventually end up getting inducted into the sex trade. Sometimes bad men from the community call children to their houses, show dirty films to them and ask them to do bad things. I never felt safe there. I always dreamt of a quiet place without fear and noise and chaos. I would wonder how I could find such a place. And then prayer now happened. In the beginning, I would miss my mother a lot. But in a couple of days, I understood that my mother would come every morning to pick me up. I always felt safe at Prerna, and I liked that feeling. To me, Prerna means safety. We are not alone at night. The staff is always there, and no one can enter the building. Today, I'm not afraid to face the outside world. I learned the importance of having an education. I learned the importance of grabbing every opportunity to learn new things. I learned that there is a world out there which is promising and full of opportunities. My mother always wanted me to be safe and do well in life. She tried to give me the best of everything. So, I want to do well in life. That is my dream. I will always give credit to Prerna for who I become. work for 28 years. Can you tell us about the progress you've seen over almost three decades in changing these worlds? Maybe I should start with uh, the recent developments. Uh, June is a very, very important month for students in India. Especially uh, in India, the 10th and 12th standard board exams mean a lot to students. There was a time when I started work 28 years ago. We didn't have a single child going to school in spite of having a large, a real large school in the midst of the red light area. 
And this year, we had over 47 children who appeared for their 10 standard board exams. With out of those 47, almost, I think over 30 have got more than 70%. And the highest scorer is a girl child with 77%. And this is the progress that we've seen with students growing up, doing their masters in social work, becoming engineers, doing their um, science graduation with information technology. Yeah, so if you invest in children, no matter where they are born, I think you definitely see good progress and see change and see, I mean, see the difference that they definitely become productive individuals. And yeah, and you can involve them to participate in peace processes. They are no more angry and they are no more violent. It seems that with every one of these women today, you saw a gap, you saw a need that needed to be filled in your everyday world. What was that moment for you? What, what year was it? Was there a young girl? Was there a young boy? When you said, I need to make a difference here. Um, this was in 1986. Of course, I had a small ex exposure to the red light area when I was doing my bachelor's in social work. But um, started looking at the red light area in 1986 in my early 20s. Um, of course, it wasn't me alone. We were a small group of three of us, which includes my husband. It wasn't my husband then. Um, and uh, we started moving around these, these lanes uh, in the then known uh, largest red light area in Mumbai and maybe Asia. Uh, called Kamatipura, and um, yeah, I mean, every day we went to these these brothels. We did see a lot of uh, violence. We did see, we did experience a lot of exploitation. But what really shook us was one evening when we were going around these red light areas, we we noticed. Of course, that was perhaps the first time it hit us, and then we started noticing this pattern. Uh, almost everywhere was three generations soliciting at the same time, and the youngest was as young as 14 years. And um, it was it was so sad, and I mean, we we really felt so helpless because there was this young girl who was 14, her mother and her grandmother. And the customers coming and looking at all three of them, and this little 14-year-old girl, you know, while her mother would say, stand straight. And then she would stand straight for a while, and then again go down and wanting to go and play with the other children, wanting to spend time with that little dog there. And her mother would again pull her and say, no, stand straight, and she would come again. And stand like this and you know that I'm living in this world in this city where a child can be put up for sale and these men probably were three times her age and actually scrutinizing her and seeing you know trying to visualize what is the kind of pleasure they would get from her I think that really got us and we were like, no, we have to stay here and, and make that change. And that's how this 28 years of journey. That's quite a story. And you know, I, I have to say, I can't tell you how many times I have felt that same kind of helplessness. And what is it, because you're talking about when you were in your 20s, and there are many people in this room in their 20s. This is an important story. How do you say, this is the moment where I'm going to make a difference? Um, I, again, you know, when I, uh, uh, all these years when I've uh, thought about um, my entire journey, um, I think I, 
I started on and I continue also because I mean, I, I, I have not come from a very rich background, not at all a very simple middle class Indian family, but a very protected family, very safe, very secure. And suddenly you, you are exposed to this world where anybody can do anything with you and there's absolutely nobody who really cares. You know, there exists this absolutely invisible, excluded children. And when you talk to people about the plight of these children, the reaction of the civil society is very, you know, they're very apathetic. And their reaction is, well, we need prostitution in our society so that girls like you, you know, I'm in 20s, so that girls like you are protected. And I'm like, you know, on one, and if you go back, uh, 1986 was the time when, you know, we were all talking about human rights and we were all talking about child rights. We said human rights wasn't enough. We needed to have a special convention on children's rights because somewhere children are getting lost in this whole discourse of human rights. Human rights, people are only concentrating on adults. And in the midst of all that, there's this big community. And, and of course, you probably all of you know India is a very populated nation. And for us, 10,000, when I say, is a very small number. And then you have this big red light area, and there are children all around. And on the other hand, we're sitting in these fancy offices, government departments, talking about children's rights. and. This, for me, was the worst form of violation of children's rights. I mean, if I walk the street, if somebody touches me, believe me, I just turn around and I'm ready to slap that person. Just, I mean, I forget I have no power. Maybe I'm violating. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll be on the other side of the law. But I'm just ready to just hit and physically hit. And here there are these children who are being touched, fondled. And then you, you talk to their mothers and you talk to their children and they think, well, this is normal. This is how we all are. And then suddenly it hits you that there is this whole community which, you know, one community where I come from, where I'll not tolerate even the smallest bit of exploitation. And there is this other community which is just internalized exploitation where they found support systems within, within an exploitative system and where they believe that, well, we are going to be in this vicious circle. I mean, there's no exit. I, this is it. This is how uh, we are destined to be. And I think that's something, you know, you are, you lead a life where you want to talk about rights and you want to talk about your personal rights and there are these voiceless, invisible, excluded children and nobody cares for them and, and society thinks, well, they, they should be here. Where else would they be? You know, you want prostitutes, so it's better that children born in the red light area are, are inducted rather than, you know, <laughs> traffickers and pimps going out and getting fresh girls to fill up the brothels. It is so true that we internalize our, our normalcy of sorts and we also allow such exploitation as a part of our normal yeah. sphere. I know there are lots of people in the audience who uh, have comments and questions here and right. Uh, have you asked a question yet? I'm going to go, if you don't mind, and then we'll come back around to you. There's someone right here, and if you could just uh, raise your hand so we can get the next. Thank Please you. Introduce My name is yourself. Adela, um, coming from the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, thank you, and I feel really honored to be with you, having access to justice, access to finance, and access to the basic human right. I think for us, we take it for granted, but in other places, it's not. So I was thinking, what would happen in the future for us, uh, for, for the persons who are beneficiaries of your programs? Are you nurturing other people, like other generations? I'm sure that, you know, these kids 
look at you as a mother, grandmother, and what would happen when you're not there uh, makes me fearful. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you about that. Next question, uh, right here in the middle in the orange. Hi, my name's Hayel um, from Pepperdine University. And I wanted to ask you, is there any kind of counseling going on while you're carrying out these social, like a uh, child care program for the kids, you know, thinking about their home life and about how they are going to use that or, uh, yeah, just about that counseling. Thank you. And third question. Hi, um, my name's Lottie and I'm a student at the George Washington University and my question is, um, since it's so normal and you see grandmothers and mothers and daughters, how are you able to get started and convince the mothers that it's not normal for their 14-year-old daughters to be earning money this way and to get started and have them go to school and participate in like classes and dancing and just be a child if the mothers and the grandmothers both grew up in this kind of culture? And is there one last question up there in the... Uh Black. Hi, my name is Amy Anderson, and I work at a public charter high school. And I'm just wondering if there are economic, um, if there's ability for these women to have jobs um, other than prostitution, if that's being worked on as well. Great, thank you. Pretty, a lot of questions, and I'm sure many more. Yeah, they call me a grandmother and it feels so sad. I just feel it's because of my gray hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do have older generation coming in. They're still connected with the program, uh, but we do not insist. We do not insist because they're there are children who've come and told us uh, they do not want to come back to the program because it's a constant reality of what happened to their mothers, where they were born. Uh, so we do not in insist, but we still have uh, older children who come back to our program. In terms of what will happen to them, um, supposing we are not there, then uh, first and foremost, yes, we don't want to be there. We want to shut down as soon as possible. And uh, what we've done um, and what we believe in is uh, that we need to socialize intervention and not monopolize. So if you see our organization, yes, it's 28 years old, but it's a very small organization. It, it, it's, it's not about having many chapters in different states. It was our effort to demonstrate and show to the world that here exists this group. If you do this kind of intervention, this is what can happen. And it's all about mentoring others who want to do similar work. So we've We've had many partners, we have many organizations in India doing similar work uh, today. And uh, if you look at our entire process, the way we've built uh, the care plans around these children is that uh, uh, it, it's around sus getting them to sustain themselves so that they're not dependent on an organization. It's also linking them up with other organizations in and around uh, uh, Mumbai and wherever we work. And it's also helping them understand to network with other organizations and not to depend just on us. So except for a few programs that we've innovated, what we've always tried to do is mainstream our intervention as well. We do not want to set up, and we've never aimed at setting up exclusive programs for children of prostitutes, because that's also a lot of stigma attached to it. So what we've done is there are childcare institutions uh, around, and we feel that this child should get space in those childcare institutions and not childcare institutions built separately and exclusively for these children. So that's how we also try to socialize this issue so that people are not dependent on one organization. Uh, counseling, yes, that's a major part of our program because these children do require psychosocial counseling. They go through a lot of trauma. 
it's a lot especially when they come in contact with the outside world see when they are in that world like i said they think this is normal but when they come in contact with the outside world see we we the people in the outside world have divided the world into the good and the bad just two categories and we very clearly keep giving messages to people that prostitution and anything related to prostitution is part of the bad world and these children do experience that and that's when you know they go through a lot in their mind a lot uh, that happens to them and counselors are important and are important members of our team and we encourage counseling though it's a taboo in india to visit a counselor and our children experience that as well because we have some when they are little they're so happy to go to a counselor they're like i'm being denied that right what are these children doing in that room you know with all toys and everything so they're all like even we want to go there but when, once they grow up and they get to know counseling is a mental health issue and in india yes we are still at that stage with we where we feel mental health is equal to being mad so that's the time children are a little but yes you need to work around that as well and you know encourage them and ask them and innovate on how this whole counseling can be introduced uh, to them so we do have a counseling program uh, convincing them to go to school oh my god i must tell you uh, how shocked i was um, but before that how we convince them we didn't do everything perfect there was the school and we said if you send your child to school and we had to that was the time we actually had conversations with the brothel keepers otherwise the perpetrators of the sex trade are not part of our program we told them that if this child is away from the brothel he is going to let that woman be free terrible we did this real i mean for me it's still as a kind of a sin that probably i committed we told them you know let the mother be there let her be free to entertain customers give this child who will be away in the school for 8 hours not bothering you at all it worked perfect but the worst was when one day me and my team we were going and we were like you know the children haven't come and we have a very strong outreach program so we most of the time in these communities and in the brothels getting these children interacting with the mothers and one brothel keeper sitting you know this huge looking lady sitting on her couch she she tells the women yeah send send the children with this lady you know let her go let let your kids get educated so that they will not rot in the kind of brothels that you are in it's good 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 you know they'll be better educated and we can push them in high high class high end brothels and i was like oh, <laughs> my goodness is this what we are you know is this the kind of message we are giving and we actually came back and you know as a team we discussed oh my god you know if this is how they perceive then we need to think back and you know revisit our strategy and then we said no 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 you know let them stay in that what is it illusion and we'll make the most of it we'll still get the children out we'll look around the law and we'll see the next stage how can we use law to protect these children when they decide it's the right time to take this educated girl again to resell her so yeah economic yes i mean uh, we feel rehabilitation is what we cannot put the onus of rehabilitation on this woman the onus of rehabilitation has to be on the society because women want to move out of the sex trade their problem is who's willing to take them who's willing to it employ them so what really worked for us is victoria's model no we are not into implementing anything like this but whenever women came and said we want to move out can you give us that little fund we didn't do anything like victoria we that's not our skill sets but what we did was we got donors to give them the money saying that you give them the money they may not return it but at least they'll manage 
they are will be able to economically sustain themselves and that model with adult prostitutes has really worked very well with younger ones who were rescued from the sex trade when they were uh, 17 18 we have um, we have a very good model where we tied up with the corporate sector who trained these girls and wherever possible also employed them and uh, where shelter is a major problem in our country so it's not just giving them employment but where will they stay so we then have this very very innovative uh, model called the aftercare group home model where we would put three or four girls together they would stay we would handhold them for a couple of years and then they are independent so yes we have worked on economic rehabilitation but our challenge is not the woman her skills, her conviction to move out, our challenge is the society again, which is not willing to accept them. Pretty, thank you. And thank you for also uh, adding to our list of all the ways these women demonstrate innovation, including innovating even amid illusions. <laughs> We've come to the end of our program today, and I want to thank all of you who've joined us today, both online and also in this auditorium, for a discussion about four women's lives, four women who in their own world innovate constantly and who have clearly made the invisible visible through their dedicated service who have broken the silence in their neighborhoods, in their communities, in their countries, through their compassion and their courage to make a difference. I hope you will join me now in really recognizing these women today. <laughs>